Hello, and thank you for joining this Onc Live TV Peer Exchange, which features expert insight and case-based discussions on advanced prostate cancer. My name is Raul Concepcion, and I'm the Director of Advanced Therapeutics at Urology Associates in Nashville, Tennessee. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Chris Evans, Professor and Chairman of the Department of Urology, Urologic Surgical Oncology at the University of California, Davis, School of Medicine, Dr. T. Hagano, Professor in the Medical Oncology Division at the University of Washington School of Medicine, and a member of the Clinical Research Division at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center, Dr. Dan Petrolak, Director of the Genitourinary Oncology Research Program and Co-Director of the Signal Transduction Program at Yale Comprehensive Cancer Center, Yale School of Medicine, and Dr. Joseph Renzulli, Director of the Prostate Surgery Program and Co-Director of the Genitourinary Multidisciplinary Clinic at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University. He is also part of the University Urologic Associates in Providence, Rhode Island. Thanks again for joining us today, and let's go ahead and get started. Let's begin this first segment by discussing recent updates to the practice guidelines for metastatic prostate cancer. So we know that there, whether we look at just here in the, in the U.S. or obviously internationally, there are a number of guidelines that have come out over the past few years as it relates to this ever-changing world of advanced prostate cancer. So I think most of us all recognize that the big three probably are NCCN, AUA, and I know ASCO has come up with their most recent guidelines. So, Chris, I think you should have some recent updates for us on the on the most uh, on what's going to be announced at AUA this year on the AUA guidelines. Right, rule. So the AUA guidelines, similar to the others, uh, will vary uh, as to when they had their last update. And the AUA guidelines initially came out in 2003, and then in 2014 they had an update with about 37 more articles they took into account. And at this year's AUA. Uh, plenary session, Will Lawrence will give a update including about 10 new articles. So just as backdrop, the way the AUA guidelines work is they focus on six index cases about patients and what their scenario of castration resistant prostate cancer is. And they take essentially three aspects into account to differentiate these patients. Whether the castration resistant prostate cancer is non-metastatic versus metastatic. The second variable is whether the treatment algorithm will be based on pre-chemotherapy or post-chemotherapy. And finally, uh, the performance data, the status of the patient is whether it's poor or good. And they, and they stratify the patients and recommend therapies based on evidence across those domains. And what's new this year among the, in, the report we're going to hear at the AUA uh, will be the prevailed data uh, in which enzalutamide in a randomized phase three trial showed uh, significant survival benefit uh, over a placebo, and so that's now incorporated in the new update, as well as the updated aberaterone survival data, and so that's what's new, this, uh, the new set of guidelines coming out. Otherwise, the rest of it remains the okay. same. TSO, you're heavily involved on the NCCN guidelines, which is a little bit of a different process, correct? Yes, it is a dis different process, um, but like all the guidelines, uh, it does involve a multidisciplinary group of um, folks. Um, I think the difference is, at least being involved in the NCCN guidelines, is that they're, they're always being updated. <laughs> Every time new data comes out, there's a new call to try to update uh, the guidelines because of how heavily they're used a lot of times for reimbursement. So uh, the, this year, the 2015 NCCN guidelines for uh, metastatic prostate cancer are a little bit different than they've been in the prior years where we were also um, basically dividing patients with metastatic CRPC into those who are symptomatic versus those who are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. This year, that's shifted some to take into account uh, the presence or absence of visceral disease. So what happens early in the algorithm is that you know patients are taken care of whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, but there is a there is an emphasis on those who have good performance status um, and are minimally or asymptomatic with offering those patients sapula cell T, and then going down the treatment algorithm again divided by visceral versus non-visceral 
So that, that has been uh, a big change in the guidelines for NCCN between um, previous years and this year. And there was also that really loss of that arbitrary designation of whether it was pre-docetaxel or post-docetaxel as well, right? A little bit? Yes, a little bit, but you know, I have to say that it's still, as a clinician, that's still something I think of. When I'm seeing a patient, I'm there, well, now is this person had docetaxel right. or not? Because that will color what kinds of things I'm thinking of to treat that patient with next. So Joe, in your multidisciplinary clinic, because you, you're obviously working very closely with the patient, with your medical oncology colleagues, radiation oncologists, as well as urology, do you, are you tending to use more NCCN, AUA? Or do you battle with the medical oncologists at all in terms of you know, whether they, they tend to go towards one guideline or another? Or how does I that think, work? I think we've tended to use the NCCN guidelines more strongly. I think the updates are more frequent. And I agree with the guidelines in that the Cipollucil T earlier on and is what we're trying to achieve based on some of the quartile data that's been presented with earlier PSAs resulting in better outcomes. Yeah, and again, I think that's sort of the, you know, the one thing that I think the urology world especially is trying to identify these patients much earlier with the lower PSAs vis-a-vis -vis lower volume of disease. Dan, what about, what about the ASCO guidelines? I know those have, those have mm -hmm. some minor differences, right. but in general, your thoughts? Well, I, I, the differences really are in how they stratify or, or the level of their confidence in the data. And they're essentially the same when you look at the NCCN or, or compare them to ASCO. Um, and I think that the clinician has to decide based upon their own experience which of these guidelines works best for them. 